Get protected today at shieldmutual.com. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Arm Your Mind for Liberty video blog and podcast. Today, my topic is the self ownership principle is bollocks. I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to show you this image of basically the Statue of Liberty turned into uh, uh, one of those creatures, I forget what they're called, from um, the uh, Lord of the Rings. And instead of the statue, I'm sorry, instead of the uh, Torch of Liberty, it's the Eye of Sauron. And uh, this, uh, video, this image is pretty creepy and a little scary. Uh, it certainly freaked my son out, who is kind of a fan of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I actually took him to visit it once. He kind of thinks it's cool. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is an accurate representation of what the U.S. has uh, turned itself into. Uh, it's no longer the home of the free, the land of the brave. It's the home of the surveilled and the land of the comfortable. So anyway, uh, but getting on to my topic today is the self-ownership principle. And the self-ownership principle is really, uh, for many people, a bedrock of their libertarianism. Uh, Wikipedia tells us that self-ownership is the concept of property in one's own person, expressed as the moral or natural right of a person to have bodily integrity and to be the exclusive controller of his own body and life. According to G. Cohen, the concept of self-ownership is that, quote, each person enjoys over himself and his powers full and exclusive rights of control and use and therefore owes no service or product to anyone else that he has not contracted to supply, unquote. And, uh, you know, basically you can sum it up as I own me. Uh, in this view, the freedom of a person to voluntarily... Um, oh, it's, this is what I wanted to say. So basically this comes from uh, John Locke, in which he wrote in his two treatises on government that every man has a property in his person. And it basically means that we are free, independent, sovereign individuals. Um, each of us, you know, sovereign over our own ability to make our own decisions and live our own lives however we want. And this may seem uh, self-evident, axiomatic, uh, unquestionable, but uh, I have to say that uh, the self-ownership principle, which, um, you know, seems to have been mm, kind of enunciated um, in recent history, most notably by Murray Rothbard, uh, who is, you know, a bedrock of libertarianism in modern times for many. Uh, the self-ownership principle is, um, is a fail. It's a complete fail. And uh, we need to get it out of our, our vocabularies, out of our, um, out of our repertoire of uh, things that we talk about, that we use to tell other people about libertarianism, because it doesn't make sense on a whole number of fronts. Now, for example, um, Larkin Rose, who is a uh, well-respected individual in the liberty community, an author who uh, did uh, prison time for uh, IRS-related stuff, a uh, smart guy, a writer, um, you know, people like him. He's a prime proponent of the self-ownership principle, and I talked with him at Porkfest uh, two years ago about this topic. And he says that basically the self-ownership principle is, quote, a shorthand way to say I control this, pointing to himself, unquote. Uh, I own me, he says, means that nobody else owns me, which basically doesn't really seem to say very much. But anyway, um, and he says that if you disagree with the statement that I own me, then that means that somebody else owns me. Rothbard... Um, let's see, do I have some Rothbard here? Well, here's another uh, very common um, formulation of the self-ownership principle. You own your life. To deny this is to imply that another person has a higher claim on your life than you have. No other person or group of persons owns your life, nor do you own the lives of others. Yeah? And uh, Rothbard um, argues that um, there are only three possible views to take on self-ownership. Either one, each man has full ownership of his own body. Two, communism. No one has 100% ownership of his own body. 
Uh, number three, class rule. One group within society fully owns themselves and owns everybody else. Okay, so these are just the basics of self-ownership for those of you who may not be familiar with it or for those who may not be fully familiar with it. Um, that's self-ownership in a, nut a nutshell. Ah, here's a quote from Rothbard. This is what I was looking for a minute ago. L from his Ethics of Liberty, the Ethics of Liberty, Chapter 8. Let us set aside for a moment the corollary but more complex case of tangible property and concentrate on the question of a man's ownership rights to his own body. Here are there are two alternatives. Either we may lay down a rule that each man should be permitted, i.e. have the right to, the full ownership of his own body, or we may rule that he may not have such a complete ownership. If he does, then we have the libertarian natural law for a free society as treated above. But if he does not, if each man is not entitled to full and 100% ownership, then what does this imply? It implies either one of two conditions, and these are the cases that I mentioned before. Either it's a communist situation, or uh, one group owns themselves and owns the rest of society. Um, so this may all be old hat to you, and you may be like, yeah, I mean, George, why are you so, why are you so dense? I mean, you should be getting it by now. Uh, however, I'd like to acquaint you with reductio ad absurdum, which is a uh, logical fallacy. If your statement um, is ac accurately described by this, then it's logically false. It says reductio, reductio ad absurdum is a common form of argument which seeks to demonstrate that a statement is true by showing that a false, untenable, or absurd result follows from its denial or in turn to demonstrate that a statement is false by showing that a false, untenable, absurd, absurd result follows from its acceptance. So, for example, let's go back to the uh, Porkfest video uh, from two years ago where Larkin says, if you disagree with the statement, this is a quote, uh, that I own me, then that means that someone else owns me. This is an example of reductio ad absurdum because He's attempting to show that a statement is true. Uh, he's attempting to prove the self-ownership principle, I own me, by showing that an absurd result follows from its denial. So he's saying that either, either I own me or somebody else does. And of course, some, that somebody else owns you is absolutely absurd. Uh, so this is just on one case, one example where um, uh, you know, self-ownership principle is, is a fail. Uh, one argument for it, at least. Uh, here I have a uh, thread from Stefan Molyneux's uh, forum at freedomainradio.com. Stefan Molyneux, of course, a very well-respected, uh, very intelligent individual in the community who produces a podcast about philosophy. Uh, and here someone says, someone asks, um, let's see. How can self-ownership be justified? Rothbard wrote that self-ownership is necessary to survive and flourish, but I think it's deeper than that. This is someone asking a question. This is not Stefan Molyneux. To me, self-ownership is necessary to make basic choices in life. Without self-ownership, there is no choice or volition. Um, and um, someone, uh, interestingly, someone who later uh, recanted this position, agreed uh, that self-ownership is, you know, the best thing since sliced bacon. Uh, but Stefan's reply, and, you know, admittedly, this was uh, several years ago. This was about six years ago. He says, whose fingers did you type that post with? So th this is a clever way of him saying that uh, since you control your body, it's you who, you know, made that post, that question. It's you who, who forced, you know, through your control over your fingers, that question to come to be posted on my forum, uh, that means that you control your body. And I think the assumption here is that since you control your body, that, um, and, and the next poster puts this, then you must own it. So the next poster says, so self-ownership is self-evident because a person naturally has control over their own body. But this, dear reader, is an is-ought problem. Uh, quoting from the is-ought uh, Wikipedia page, the is-ought problem in meta-ethics, as articulated by David Hume, is uh, that many writers make claims about what 
ought to be on the basis of statements about what is. And that's it. In the, you know, so that's saying that uh, because this exists, then that ought to as well. So, for example, this argument that Stefan uh, makes here in this thread from six years ago, uh, he says that he's basically saying, uh, and I'm sure he'll correct me or one of his fans will correct me if I'm wrong, that um, be, the is is that I control my body. And so the ought that comes from that is that I, I ought to own it as well, uh, whatever that may mean. And that can mean different things to different people. And here actually um, is an interesting post uh, from a community blog. And actually, <laughs> interestingly, is the person, uh, Brain Police, the person who um, posted in that thread six years ago supporting the idea. And he says, uh, to summarize, he, he's no longer for self-ownership. He, no, he, he agrees with me, I think, uh, at least partially, on the general idea that self-ownership, the self-ownership principle is complete bollocks. To summarize the problem, who exactly is it that is doing the owning? If I own it, then it is not me. If I am owned, then I am not the owner. One cannot be both the owned and the owner at the same time. Using the analogy that the mind owns the body doesn't really work because the mind is also part of the body. There is a coherent whole in reality. The mind and body are not metaphysically detached to the point where we can treat them as completely independent entities. Hence, the way in which libertarians commonly put forward the concept of self-ownership is flawed and must be revised to what is really meant by the concept, i.e. individual sovereignty, which is an ethical concept rather than a descriptive one. Um, and he says, you know, this is basically... Um, that by virtue of you arguing and generally purposefully acting, you implicitly acknowledge self-ownership. Uh, this is a position of uh, Stefan Molyneux, uh, UPB, Universal Preferable Behavior. And it's the same thing Stefan said in the, the forum post from six years ago I just quoted. But, says Brain Police, this is to totally confuse an is with an ought or descriptive ethics with uh, normative ethics. Yes? Um, and, it, you know... Another question, uh, you know, if we're talking about people that can be owned, can we then, uh, you know, just as I can, um, you know, I have, uh, let's see, I have a, a pen here. I own it, presumably. You could say that. But I could also transfer ownership. Things that I own, I can transfer ownership of. Uh, and so um, there's an interesting article here by Robert Lafavre, I think that's how his name is pronounced, who is a very influential uh, liberty guy, uh, philosopher, teacher, whatnot. Who I, I like him a lot. Uh, writing um, some years ago about this topic. Um, from man's recognition that he owns himself, he's a proponent of, of self-ownership, and from the idea of private ownership, which begins at this point, if not chronologically, at least rationally, it is but a step to the creation of one kind of improper ownership, the condition in which it is presumed that one person owns another. If a man owns himself, why can't he own another? It would seem superficially that he could. Certainly mothers and later fathers looked upon their offspring as chattels. Children were viewed as property and not as persons. Um, when I was small, my dad told me I was his property. Yeah. So that, that may uh, color my take on this. Uh, and basically, uh, Robert goes on to explain why uh, this idea that, uh, that the self-ownership principle enables ownership of one person by another is um, untenable or unreasonable. But I didn't, frankly, find it convincing. And so I think beyond the uh, is-ought problem, beyond the, um, the reductio ad, ad, ad absurdum problem, is the idea that once we start talking about people owning people... Um, you know, we're, we're getting kind of into a dangerous area where, um, you know, you may disagree that a reasonable case could be made for uh, justifying slavery under the self-ownership principle. You may, you may argue against that, perhaps convincingly. But if, from a public relations point of view, if you're using the self-ownership principle as a, as a public relations thing to sell libertarianism, uh, it's so easy to, for people to confuse that and to say that it enables, that the self-ownership principle enables slavery. And so on that, f that point as well, self-ownership principle is a 
fail. Um, and here's another uh, point on which it's a fail, on which, uh, you know, one that I have made um, several times. It, uh, you know, when you start with the justification for, for liberty, you start with life. Um, life, liberty, property, or life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. These go together and for good reason. Uh, I have my life. Uh, because I have my life, I have the right to, um, you know, to, to sustain it, to pursue it to its greatest ends, and so I need my liberty. And in order for me to have my liberty, I need to be able to have property so that I can, for example, claim a, a little bit of land and be able to eat and have shelter, because without that, I, I can't really pursue my liberty. And so life, liberty, property, that's the order. Uh, and so here, here's a comment uh, from the Mises.org forums. Self-ownership, says user Neodoxy, doesn't make sense specifically because ownership itself is a social construct. Ownership is not something physical. There is certainly self-control, but an ought cannot be made from an is. If you're using self-control and self-ownership synonymously, then of course one can control oneself. Um, so, you know, if you're starting with the self-ownership principle, if you're saying that's axiomatic and that's the foundation, um, well, you know, before man is a social creature, he has to exist and he has to bring something with him. If you accept rights theory, he has to bring something with him into these social situations with other people. Uh, if there are no other people present, if it's just an individual on a desert island alone by himself, there's no use for the, uh, the concept of property because property distinguish what's, distinguish, distinguishes what's mine from what's yours. So if there's nobody else there, well, it's all mine. I mean, if I want it to be. Um, so property is a social construct, but if we're going to bring our rights, we have to bring our rights um, you know, with us before we come into that social situation, at least according to some people, and um, so it's kind of backwards, you know, life, liberty, property. Okay, but we're reversing that. Property, in other words, I own me, self-ownership. Then me, I have the right to control me and liberty and all this other stuff. It's kind of nonsensical to put property first in the form of the self-ownership principle. Uh, it's backwards, yeah? Uh, let's see, another article here from uh, Francois Tremblay, um, a smart guy who's a bit of a jerk, at least he was a jerk to me. Um, and on another front, for one thing, there is no such thing as the self, at least in the common conception of what the self might be. There is no entity somewhere in me called Francois Tremblay. What I might associate with myself, my memories, my personality, my capacity to reason, my recognition of other people, and many other things, are all part of an ever-fluctuating mass of neurons. A more sane concept of the self may be to define the self as a process of experience, not as fixed states. But even if we take this view, how is the self bounded? Is it in the mind, which is the construct through which we receive our experience? But the mind is an activity of the brain, and therefore we cannot isolate the mind from the brain. So is the self bounded by the brain? But without the rest of the body, especially our sensory organs and our nervous system, the brain is, is useless as a source of selfhood. The self, therefore, if it is to make sense at all, must be a property of the body, not merely of one or the other organ. This leads us to the rather disappointing conclusion that self-ownership means the body owns the body. But this is an utterly trivial and useless proposition. When I say I own this chair, I mean nothing more than the fact that I legitimately control the chair. But there can be no relationship of control between an entity and itself. If there is no distinction between the owner and the owned, then no relationship of ownership actually um, does not and cannot e exist. The body itself is a moral agent, a self, and therefore it cannot possibly be, be owned by anything or anyone. Yeah, I own me. That's circular. I own I. I mean, I am I. Um, but anyway, it, that's circular. And it, he has another point, which is, uh, I think, brought up in the next article uh, from gonzotimes.com. And the author is, um, doesn't say, probably my friend Johnny Cash. 
Punk Johnny Cash. The real problem with self-ownership lies in the word ownership. I cannot technically own my arm or any other part of myself because it is myself. Even on the most basic level, there is no agent to hold the ownership. Uh, so basically, uh, the self-ownership principle is fail, total fail on multiple levels. Uh, first off, we have uh, the fact that um, Reduct in order to show it, we have to use a reductio ad absurdum. We have to compare it to an absurd thing and say, if that absurd thing's not true, then, then this other thing I said, the self ownership principle, has to be true. It confuses an is and an ought uh, because it is true that we control ourselves. That's certainly demonstrably true, at least um, to, to many people. There may be some disagreements uh, by Descartes fans. Um, then we ought to be able to say that we own ourselves, but that's, that's an is and an ought. That's another logical fallacy. Uh, another point is that, um, you know, you, if you admit that, then you may get into trouble by being able to say that people can be owned, uh, which may lead to, uh, slavery, whether you think that's reasonable or not. I think it's a valid criticism. You know, if you start owning people, then you can start transferring title of those people. Um, another issue is that, um, you know, it's impossible to own yourself. I mean, it's circular. You're just saying, I own me. Uh, there's no moral agent there. I mean, somebody has to own something, and it's just all kinds of circular there. There's nobody to hold the ownership. I mean... Uh, apart from the fact that, you know, I don't think any of us want to be making arguments about how people can be owned. Uh, and uh, the final one is ownership is a social construct. And so it happens way beyond the point where we're talking about me having control over me. You know, I have control over me. Uh, I have a certain nature. And so, uh, you know, I need to be able to sustain me. And that's how we get life, liberty and property, and um, to go back and put ownership at the beginning is all kinds of screwed up. So um, the self-ownership principle is complete fail, it's complete bollocks, stop talking about it, just drop it, it doesn't work, uh, we should be getting past this uh, to better ways of thinking about these things. Uh, if you have a better way of thinking about it or if you disagree or whatever, you can give me a call at this number, leave me a voicemail. You can, if you're on YouTube, you can leave a comment down here. If you're on a blog, I, on my blog, I also have comments there. Uh, let me know what you think. I'm sure that uh, some people will disagree, but frankly, uh, I've been, you know, I've never really thought that the self-ownership principle made sense, and I've been thinking about this for several years. Um, so I, I don't think you're gonna be able to convince me and I think uh, that it, I don't think you're gonna be able to convince me that it makes sense. And frankly, I don't think anybody should be convinced by this. Uh, it's pure nonsense that Murray ba Rothbard invented. And uh, as a community, we need to get past it and figure out better, more sensible ways to talk about, um, you know, the foundation of liberty. So uh, have a great day, and thanks for listening. Uh, there'll be another episode soon. Get protected today at shieldmutual.com.